r slash no sleep posted by you slash britain rt the records of sam parks candace's disappearing dog i won't lie i thought it was laughable a dog which just vanishes and reappears at random i'm just telling you what she said sam seemed as optimistic as ever she's sending a video soon we'll hopefully see it for ourselves then i didn't understand why the woman didn't just post it on youtube or something Sam still hadn't explained how she had even encountered the woman. I supposed at that point that the time to ask had come. How did you meet her exactly? She hesitated, then came clean. On my Facebook group. She reached out the other day. Sam seemed irritated by my line of questioning. I had not been aware of any Facebook group. Can I see it? She seemed to shy away. I already knew where this was going though. She had wanted to share the materials we'd been collecting for a while. I had advised against it, suggesting we wait until we had a substantial body of evidence before going public with any of it. I had felt very strongly about it at the time, not just because I thought it was the right move, but because I was worried and embarrassed. I didn't want to be thought of as a crackpot by those who knew me. Well, of course she had gone and started sharing it anyways, probably with people who were actually crackpots. I wasn't the least bit surprised. Look, it's all right. I'm not mad, I'm just curious. It wasn't a lie. I had to see this for myself. I wound up sitting next to her on the couch with her laptop sitting between us. She fingered about the touchpad, pulling up her account and navigating to the group. I had thought I was ready for anything but was actually pretty unhappy when it came up. The records of Sam Parks, I said the name of the group out loud, emphasizing each guttural vowel with displeasure. From what I could tell, she had posted everything. I recall frowning pretty intensely as I read through some of the material she had put up. Sam. We agreed not to do this yet. I know. And I'm sorry. But I have found some really good leads through this. What's the harm? She was giving me puppy dog eyes as she said it. And of course it fucking worked. Well, sort of. I was still pissed off, but I couldn't stay mad at her. It's private, at least? I asked. Of course. Invite me. And please, please try to keep it low profile. This was really important to me. My main goal was to assemble a compelling body of evidence and we weren't even close. Videos were great but they could be faked. Our best bet was to get reputable experts out to the mine or the school we had discovered, but nobody was going to take us seriously unless we had something more substantive. I felt pretty certain at the time, at least. Sammy sent me an invite. I'd accept it later. So tell me more about this supposed vanishing dog. I wanted to get off the awkward subject of her abject betrayal. Apparently she couldn't be trusted to keep secrets. I suppose I had always known that to be true. Well, I don't know yet. I've pretty much told you everything. But she lives here in Tucson so it shouldn't be a big deal to go check it out. As good an argument as any she could have made. Alright then. I was getting pretty tired. We'll call up the crew in the morning and check it out, assuming she's available. Meanwhile, I'm going to locate my pillow. I got up and headed to the bedroom. Sam followed me and we huddled together for a while under the blankets. I often hesitate to write about these more intimate sorts of moments because they are painful. But at the same time I feel compelled to include them. An acknowledgement of what once was, for what little that is worth now. I recall my dreams being unusual that night, but I can't remember what they were. Yet their insanity drove my eyes open earlier than normal. For once, I was awake and up before Sammy, so I decided to make her breakfast. Just some simple scrambled eggs and toast. It was cold by the time she discovered the living room of my apartment. I stuck it in the toaster oven for her. Hey darling, you hungry? She nodded, but was glued to her phone. I knew she was about to show me something. I could tell by the way she looked up at me. I wasn't surprised by what it was either. This woman, Candace apparently, had sent the promised video. Sam held me as we watched it together. She had seemingly already seen it. It only lasted about 30 seconds, but it was unmistakable what was happening, real or fabricated. The little pup was just bouncing around barking at nothing and then seconds later it was gone. Moments passed and it reappeared in an instant, this time in a completely different part of the room, exactly where it had left off. I couldn't help but feel it was almost like time hadn't passed for it at all, I could swear it was mid-bark when it vanished, and that same bark had completed when it re-emerged. But what was weird is that the dog immediately started cowering and whimpering as soon as it returned. Sam looked at me expectantly, not saying a word. Fine, you win. We'll check it out. I was truly a sucker, but she had reeled me in yet again. Upon calling the woman up a bit later, 
Sam finally had the opportunity to speak with Candace more intimately about the dog and what was happening. The aging woman seemed surprisingly serene, I recall Sam telling me. I'd later come to understand it better myself. Apparently, the dog's name was Jacob, not that I particularly cared. More interestingly, she claimed the peculiar occurrences had begun only after they moved into her current home, just a few miles away from my own apartment. No road trip this time. A time was set up to meet with her and the puppy, a little beagle, a bit later that day. Alan wasn't going to be able to make it due to classes, but Jake was free in the afternoon. I texted him the directions and we all met up in front Candace's little suburban house around 4 p.m. We didn't bring a lot of equipment this time, just the cameras and laptops, since it was a quick in and out day trip to just see it with our own eyes. Candace met us at the door, having presumably seen us pull up. She was a pretty normal looking woman, probably in her 60s. Kind of an aging hippie look about her. We were ushered in and she offered us tea or beer. I took tea, Sam took a beer. She didn't waste any time getting right down to it. Jacob. She whistled. The little dog came barreling from some unseen part of the house into the living room, bouncing around happily. Thank you all for coming, this is Jacob. She lifted the dog off the floor and held him in her arms. You're a good boy, aren't you? Yes you are. I think I rolled my eyes. Or at least I wanted to. We sat around a little table shortly after she introduced her pet and she explained in a bit more detail what had been going on. It isn't just Jacob either. I've seen other things move about the house. In one place one second, and then somewhere completely different later. You've seen the video, it can happen right before your very eyes. And you said this never happened before you bought the house? I asked. Never. I called the previous owner at one point years ago, but they didn't know anything about it. I've just sort of lived with it all these years. Got used to it I guess. How long have you lived here? I guess it would be around 18 years now. I gave Sam a look as the woman said it. I was pretty incredulous. You lived in a house where your stuff randomly reshuffles around for 18 years? I couldn't find my stuff half the time even when it stayed where I put it. More talk revealed some additional details. It happened most often at night. 3 AM seemed to the peak hour, roughly, but pretty much any time after dark it was likely to start happening. Can we stay the night? I knew Sam was going to ask it, and of course she did. I don't have a guest bedroom I'm afraid, but you all can use the couches if you'd like. Oh I won't be sleeping, so don't worry about it. Sam seemed as energetic as always, but I wasn't thrilled about having her volunteer me to stay up all night. At least I didn't have work like Jake. I figured he would probably head home a bit later to get some proper rest. We passed the time chatting among ourselves. Candace asked us some questions about some of the other bizarre shit we'd encountered, and Sam happily obliged her curiosity. Apparently the woman had already gone through most of the content she'd put on Facebook, much to my displeasure. I offered to order pizza for everyone, but it turned out the woman was vegan, which didn't shock me whatsoever given her appearance, so I ordered from some weird pizza parlor that had vegan options. I controlled my temptation to get a meat supreme out of some sense of respectfulness. Once the sun started setting, I could feel the anticipation building in Sam. Even Jake was lingering longer than he probably should, given how early he had to be up. So far though, nothing noteworthy had occurred beyond me snickering at the little crystals the woman kept tucked around in random nooks and crannies all over the house. Some new age bullshit. Nothing much happened for a while, and Candace asked if it would be alright if she put on the television. None of us had any problem with that, it was her house after all. Sam was doing something on her laptop, probably posting more shit I didn't want her to post. Jake and I were just chatting about random things. I could tell he was starting to get tired. I was actually startled when the thunk echoed from down the little hall. Candace seemed unaffected. Sounds like it came from my bedroom, she said nonchalantly. Feel free to go in if you'd like, I tidied up before you arrived. You don't want to come as well? She seemed completely engrossed in some dumb looking reality show. I've seen it a thousand times. I just figured based on the stuff Ms. Parks posted that you all might find it interesting. For your research and all that. I looked at Jake and shrugged. Sam was already in the bedroom when we got there, she had run after the noise almost as soon as she had heard it. A hardback book was laying on the hardwood. I didn't see anything else that might have made a falling noise. I picked it up and looked at it. Emma. That Jane Austen book I had been forced to read in school. It was probably there all along, I said, skeptically. You heard the noise. Plus she said she tidied up, remember? I knew Sam wanted to believe. The video had been pretty convincing, but my doubts bled from me still. She could just be a kooky old lady who believes in crystal healing and knows how to edit videos. 
Jake suggested we get cameras set up in every room, and we set about doing exactly that. It took about 30 minutes to find the best spots to maximize our coverage, but I was pretty satisfied with the setup once we were done. I asked the woman about the book as soon as we settled down again. Yes, I've probably read it dozens of times now. It was the first book I ever read. I find it calming. She paused for a moment. Aside from Jacob, it is probably the other thing that moves about the most. My bookmarker is often in different places when I find it, fortunately I know it like the back of my own hand so it doesn't matter much. Nothing happened for a while after that and Candace decided to retreat to her room. We hadn't put a camera in there out of respect for her privacy, but had the rest of the house covered, including the garage. After debating whether to call in sick tomorrow, Jake ended up reluctantly taking his own leave as well, so after a quick goodbye he was off, leaving his gear with us. Sam and I sat alone on the couch and waited for something to happen, my arm wrapped around her shoulder. About 15 minutes later, something did. One of the chairs around the table disappeared. Entirely. Just gone in an instant, if you'd blinked you'd had missed it. I jumped to my feet in surprise and Sam did the same. I'm not sure what startled the girl more, the chair or me. She wasn't lying. Sam remarked. Suddenly her voice rose. See, I told you. Her grin was triumphant. Yeah, that's all well and good but. Where is it? It hadn't reappeared. Sam was perplexed as well. I don't know. The dog took a few moments to return in the video. Maybe we just need to wait. Almost on cue, the chair reappeared several feet away from where it had vanished, and a few feet in the air as well. It dropped to the floor with a loud smack, causing me to jump. Jesus Christ. I had to stop myself from shouting. Of all the things I might think in that moment, the one that came to mind was the clanging and clambering of crap in the night, interrupting any possible hope of sleep. She lived through all this noise for 18 years? I remarked as the tension settled. I couldn't imagine it, I'd go mad. Maybe she had. I looked at the crystals scattered all over the place again as I thought it. We stayed up the rest of the night but nothing else happened. I was exhausted by morning when Candace emerged from her room, offering us breakfast. We both accepted. You really didn't get woken up by the chair falling last night? I queried the old woman for a second time. Her answer was pretty much the same as the first time. I guess I've become a heavy sleeper. I had to ask her. What's with all the crystals? They're everywhere. Oh, they just help channel positive energy throughout the house. Of course they did, I remember thinking. Sam could see the judgmental look on my face and elbowed me. Jacob came barreling out of the Candace's room as soon as the woman started pouring dog food into his little bowl in the kitchen. He's a cute little thing. Sam remarked to me, but I was never much of a pet person. As we all ate, Sam asked a question I hadn't even thought about. So Jacob had disappeared at times, clearly. Talking with food in her mouth again, it was somewhat embarrassing. Have you ever disappeared? Candace seemed a bit surprised at the question. No. I suppose I haven't. Don't you think that seems a bit odd? Sam added. I had to admit, now that she had pointed it out, it did seem a bit odd. There wasn't any point in speculating though, and once we were done with breakfast we took our leave. Candace agreed to let us come back again the next night, and quick calls were made to Jake and Alan to let them know. I was so tired by the time we got to my apartment that I crashed almost the moment I hit the bed, clothes still on. I woke much later in the day to find myself spooning Sam on the mattress. She was curled up in an adorable little ball. I felt bad waking her but there was no way to extricate myself without somewhat disturbing the girl. She blinked awake as well once I started moving, and had claimed the shower before I even had my shirt off. Most of the rest of the day was spent looking through the video footage, but the only thing we had caught was the same thing we had seen already, the teleporting chair. A bit later, both Jake and Alan showed up within about an hour of each other and we showed the footage to them as well. Since it was Friday, both of them decided they'd spend the night there with us. They were just as eager as Sam and I to see more of the inexplicable excitements. After stopping by Taco Bell for a healthy dinner on the way to Candace's house, we finally arrived again at the little stuccoed building she called home. Cameras were set up throughout the various rooms, and once we were satisfied that everything was in order, the waiting game began. Candace suggested a different kind of game though. Do you all like Scrabble? I haven't had guests over in a while, it might be fun. Her suggestion was well received and we spent several hours fucking about with words around the living room coffee table. Jake ended up winning. Candace went to bed after that and the whiskey came out to accompany a follow-up game. No way I was going to let him keep his title. We were pretty deep in and I had already cracked a Red Bull. I knew it was going to be a long night, 
and the booze wasn't going to make it any easier to stay awake. But around 1 am I heard a yelp to my right. Everyone looked all at once to find the puppy whining on the floor next to us. I could swear it hadn't been in the room. After an exchange of nervous looks, we all scrambled for the camera. When the footage was on screen, astonishment hovered about us as the little dog appeared in midair just to my right and fell to the floor. Of course we watched it several more times. We need to get the camera back up immediately. Alan more or less ordered, but everyone was on the same page, and soon we were recording again. Jake went to check the other cameras, just in case they caught anything we hadn't noticed, but came back empty-handed. Once we were seated on the couches again, Sam had another of the unusual insights which I eventually realized to find her. As excitable and curious as she was, she actually put a surprising amount of thought into these odd things. Why don't things appear in walls? Or in other objects? It took a moment for me to comprehend her question. This line of thinking hadn't occurred to me. Alan jumped in first. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. You said she's lived here 18 years, and in that time everything always reappears somewhere empty? It was an odd observation, but I wasn't sure where it was going. I wonder. Sam started. Here we go, I recall thinking. I wonder if that implies some kind of intelligence. Like it isn't just random, but something is moving stuff around on purpose. How was I supposed to know? But it could maybe help explain why Candace herself had never vanished. I guess. It was a theory, at least. Much to my embarrassment, Sam started asking questions to the air. Hello? Is anyone there? She got up and started walking around the house, trying to talk to something that probably didn't exist. She gave up after about 10 minutes and we resumed our game, the initial excitement starting to fade. As we approached 2.30 am, something else happened, this time a clank from the kitchen. Nobody was really surprised this time to see the frying pan laying upside down in the middle of the tiled floor. Again the cameras were checked, and again they revealed the sudden appearance of the object mid-air, followed by its rapid descent. This was the first time Jake had actually been on an expedition with real activity, and he seemed particularly excited by it. He had seen our videos many times but I could tell that he had been growing increasingly skeptical during the last few since they went nowhere. Do you think she's playing a prank on us? He speculated as we watched it again. If this is some kind of magic trick, she should be doing shows in Vegas. Alan replied. Sam pointed out that we couldn't see where the pan came from. Maybe inside one of the cabinets beneath the countertop? We started checking them, but there was no way to be sure, not that it really mattered where it originated from. I wonder how far things can move? Like across the whole house? And why not outside? I realized as Jake stated it that we had never asked the question. For all I knew, maybe it was happening there as well? We hadn't set up any cameras outside of the house. I didn't have long to think about it though before it happened. It was one of a handful of the most terrifying moments in my entire life. Jake, Alan, and I just stood in complete shock for a second or two, maybe three. We had all seen it, but it was clear nobody had the slightest idea what to say or do. To my complete and utter horror, Sam had just vanished right before our eyes. No. I was frozen, my mind racing in terror. No, no 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 no. Alan was already plugging the kitchen camera into the laptop while I stood there in disbelief. Once I recuperated, I joined him and Jake. The intensity of the fear in me at that moment is something I recall quite clearly. I wasn't religious, but I begged to any god who might listen to return the woman I loved so much. Every second which went by was agony. We watched the moment she disappeared, caught on video. It was just like that, one moment she was there, the next she was absent. Alan started to try and analyze it in more detail when we all heard the sound of something falling behind us onto the wooden floor. I didn't have to guess what it was and ran to Sam immediately. Are you alright? I recall the look on her face quite well as I held her. It was fear. A few moments were required for her to find her voice, but when she did, she just whispered. We need to leave. For once, she was the one being reasonable, and I wasn't going to argue with her over it for a second. After a quick debate, everyone agreed and both Jake and Alan were kind enough to pack up the gear while I helped Sam to the jeep. I wanted to be out of that house which had snatched up my girlfriend right before my very eyes. By the time the four of us got back to my place, Sammy had calmed down a bit and seemed a tad more talkative. She explained what she had experienced as best as she could. It was like I was still in the house, but there was no light at all. I'm not sure how I could see, but I remember looking out the window and seeing no stars or moon or anything. She seemed a bit traumatized as she spoke. I wasn't alone. There was this thing in the corner of the ceiling. It looked kind of like a spider, but it was huge and had so many legs, maybe a hundred. 
I tried to imagine it as she spoke. I'm sure it's what is moving everything. It touched me with one of its legs and I was suddenly falling. I had to ask. Did it seem dangerous? Sam took a moment to reply. I don't know. I guess not, considering Candace has been living there so long. I don't really want to see it again. I could tell how frightened she was. If something scared Sam, I knew it must be terrifying. But I think I have too. We don't have to go back. I offered, but the words triggered the Sam I knew to re-emerge. Of course we have to go back, are you crazy? Jake and Alan seemed to be neutral in the debate, and Sam and I shot back and forth a few times. I didn't want to ever see her disappear again, and wasn't thrilled about the idea of having it happen to anyone else either. I want to get a camera in there. Sam finally made her ultimate point. How do you know the camera will travel with you? It was my ultimate counter. My clothes came with me, didn't they? It was true that she hadn't returned butt naked. I didn't have an ultimate rebuttal. I finally acquiesced, we'd go back the next evening, assuming Candace agreed. And under one condition, Sam would carry my pistol, just to be safe. Candace did end up agreeing, and we went over early the next afternoon to meet with her once again. She made snacks for the four of us as Sam described to her the details of the experience. You're telling me there is a giant spider in my house? It wasn't a spider, that's just the closest thing I can think of to describe it. It had spindly legs like a spider but hundreds of them coming out in all directions. It was like nothing but legs. I could tell Candace was unhappy. Maybe she didn't like spiders? I know I didn't. It's right over there. Sam pointed toward the corner of the living room, the intersection of two walls and the ceiling. It was just sitting there, hanging from the corner, prodding at stuff. Certainty was what I felt. Certainty that Candace would never go to that corner of the room again. I could already imagine the real spider starting to accumulate there due to neglect. Or maybe she'd stack her crystals to the ceiling in that corner, in some voodoo attempt to cleanse the area? Who could know? Alright, well you all are welcome to stay as many nights as you need. Just let me know if you need anything. I'm going to do some reading. It was obvious to me she just wanted to be out of the room after hearing Sam's story. We watched a random movie on her cable subscription once we had everything set up again. This time, we had hand cameras for all four of us as well as a tripod mounted one pointed directly at the corner of the ceiling Sam had noted. If any of us disappeared, we'd be ready. At least, that was what I hoped then. More speculation ensued as we waited for some kind of development or activity to occur. Why do you think she's never vanished? Now that we know it's possible. I wasn't sure why Sam kept asking this question, obviously nobody had the answer. The whiskey and scrabble came out again and we began the long evening. As before, it was mostly uneventful until after midnight. I was proudly completing the word preposterous when the a suddenly vanished right in front of us. I wasn't sure whether to laugh or curse. We all grew tense though, and Alan had his camera in hand in an instant, recording to see if anything else would happen. It did. An H disappeared off the board. Then a piece vanished off of Jake's line of hidden letters. What was it? Sam asked while Alan filmed. I'm not telling you, that would be cheaty. Oh my fucking god. I interjected with irritation. I couldn't believe he was still thinking about the game. What was the goddamned letter? Jesus, it was an L, chill the fuck out. He definitely looked annoyed at my outburst, so I apologized. I'm sorry, I'm just a bit on edge. I knew we all were. He didn't make anything more of it. We watched as two more letters vanished over the next few minutes. It was an E and finally another L. Alan kept filming to see if anything else would happen, but after that it was eerily quiet and normal. Almost two hours passed and we just drank and speculated over our ruined game. When it became clear that nothing more was occurring, conversation turned to the letters themselves. Sam was the first one to point out that there was really only one word they could be arranged into. Hello. It made me uncomfortable. Not to mention that they still hadn't reappeared. That particularly bothered me, because it implied that things didn't have to come back. My mind couldn't stop thinking about when Sam had vanished. What if she never returned? I took a healthy swig of the whiskey and drowned it with some coke. It could just be random. A coincidence. It was a nice thought, one nobody could specifically dispel. But I hadn't realized at that moment just how right Sam had been, yet again. It happened so fast. One moment, they were all there, and the next they were gone. It must have taken them, I recall thinking. But after a few seconds of inspection, I realized what had happened. They hadn't vanished. I had. A strange black light poured through the windows. I could somehow see, but it was as though there were beams of darkness straying in through the curtains like some perverse inversion of a beam of sunlight. 
and I knew it was there. I could hear it behind me, clicking disturbingly, my back to it as I sat on the couch. The game of the Scrabble was arrayed on the board exactly as it had been, just missing the handful of stolen letters. Those letters were lined up in front of me on the coffee table. In the exact order Sam had speculated on. Hello. I nervously turned my head and looked behind me. Sam had been conservative, perhaps even kind in her description of the thing. It clung to the corner of the room, legs like a black widow but with far more joints, going out in every direction from its inscrutable core. I'll admit it, I screamed. Hardly a minute had passed after I had run out the back door of the house into the fenced-in yard. I tried to catch my breath as I looked back through the glass sliding door. It was still there, just stuck in that corner. It prodded at random objects, but mostly left them alone. What was it doing? It took me a bit of time before I noticed it. Up in the endless black sky. How I had missed it until then was a mystery, my mind must have been too preoccupied with the strange creature in the house. There was a sun. But it glowed with darkness instead of light, pouring it out and smothering the world in it. Explaining it is difficult, but I didn't like being under it. It took all of my courage to re-enter the house and stand before the strange being again. It was revolting, the way it twitched and bent its uncountable legs, bringing forth every fear I ever had of spiders crawling into my bed at night, or creeping into my clothes. But the letters were still there on the table. Hello. I kept my distance but finally decided to speak. Can you understand me? Nothing happened for a moment and I figured it probably couldn't, but then it started touching a few more pieces on the Scrabble board with some of its legs, moving them into a line along the table. I hesitantly approached to get a better view, still afraid to get too close to the thing. Yes. I asked the only thing I could think to ask. What are you? It took a moment for it to arrange the letters. But there was no mistaking them. Friend. The monstrosity didn't look like anything I could consider friendly at the time. It was only later I'd really come to even begin to understand the unfortunate monster's predicament. I need you to send me back, please. I was ready to be back with Sam and the others. Can you do that? It immediately began toying with more Scrabble pieces. They were arrayed in an almost heartbreaking fashion. Lonely. I didn't know how to respond as the disturbing ball of spider legs wriggled in the corner. It was as far from any response I had expected as could be imagined. I started to wonder if it was going to keep me in that place forever. That thought on my mind, another question came to me. Where is this, anyways? I asked it. To answer this, it simply touched the O in hello, causing it to disappear. Oh, I remember thinking, once it connected. I took in the bleak place. It looked like the same house in almost every way, but for the black sun flooding the rooms with its antithesis of radiance. I wasn't religious, and certainly didn't believe in things like God and Satan, but I couldn't deny that whatever this place was seemed real. I still didn't understand what was going on. What are you? I tried one more time. It arranged more letters in response. Candace. I frowned as I read the upside down letters. What all of this meant, I couldn't even begin to imagine at the time. Was it saying it was the woman who had brought us here? Did she know? Or was it trying to tell me something else entirely? I need to go, I beg you. I was desperate to get out of this dark place. And to my infinite relief, one of the spindly arms crept out and touched me on the forehead, despite my terror of it at the time. As soon as I felt it, I was slamming to the floor, still in the same sitting position I had been in on the couch. Daniel. I could hear every ounce of the distress mixed with relief in Sam's voice as she nearly tackled me. My knee hurt from hitting the floor after my fall. Lay off for a second, Jesus, I said, while Alan continued to film. How long was I gone? Sam just clung to me while Jake responded. About 22 minutes. It felt like forever. We weren't sure you'd ever come back. I spent the rest of the night explaining what had happened to them, as best I could. Sam at least seemed to be able to corroborate some of my claims, so I didn't feel entirely mad as I went on about the colorless house, the black sun, and the strange creature hiding in the corner. I held back only one detail. The name the creature had given me. I was still trying to process it. When Candace woke up a bit later, she offered to make us breakfast again. We all accepted and chattered around the table as we ate eggs and sausages. I remember being surprised since she was a vegan, she just ate cereal herself that morning. But she must have gone out of her way to buy them for us. To cook it for us, even though it went against what she believed in. It made me think. I wondered if she was lonely. Alone in this little house, all by herself. Just tiny Jacob to keep her company. The disappearing dog, maybe keeping her company not just here but also in that other place. We eventually tore down our equipment and headed to the jeep. 
The drive back was brief and quiet, the fresh fall Tucson air washing over Sam and I as we cruised back home. I had let her drive this time, and I stared absently out at the passing houses and cars. All four of us recollected at my sprawling apartment downtown and we reviewed all the footage we had gathered over the last few nights for several hours straight. We had gotten a few good bits, the most dramatic being myself vanishing off the couch last night, as well as Sam the night before. Sadly, I hadn't had my camera in hand when I had been taken, so we had nothing but me and Sam's anecdotes, but we both wrote down as much as we could remember. Eventually, tiredness overtook everyone. It had been a long weekend, and there was a lot to digest from it all. I had two spare bedrooms and let Jake and Alan both crash at my place. I was planning to head to bed soon myself. Sam and I stood for a while alone at the large glass face which looked out over downtown. The cars and people bustled about beneath us as I held her tight. It was something we had done many times. The memory of her head leaning on my shoulder still haunts me to this day. After a bit of silent revelry, the two of us also went to find our own slumber. We chatted about little nothings for a while, before Sam fetched her laptop and started checking in on her small community. I had my glasses off, so couldn't really make it out, but she was scrolling through page after page of postings. I was still a bit uncertain I approved, but I wasn't her boss. I was just glad she was happy. 10 to 15 minutes passed in silence. Sammy, there's something I didn't tell you. I knew I was going to have to come out with it sooner or later. She just looked at me, saying nothing, waiting for me to continue. That thing we saw, in that other place. I wasn't sure how to describe it, but I knew she understood. It told me it was Candace. More quiet contemplation from Sam. She started to say something, but I saw her clearly stop before anything left her mouth. It spoke to you? It used the Scrabble board to write a few words. I replied. What do you think that place was? She asked. I didn't know. I didn't tell Sam what she had said, because I wasn't sure I believed it myself. The literal and figurative felt like a jumbled and juxtaposed blur in my head. I just knew I felt bad for the woman, living alone with her dog. Maybe I'd go visit her again sometime. Just to check in. I was sure she needed a friend. Meanwhile, there was a whole world of strange shit out there to discover. So. I started. Found anything else interesting on that community of yours? Actually, yes. Check this out. The records of Sam Parks, the crying lady. Neither of us had been certain how he acquired Sam's personal email address, but after half a dozen fruitless expeditions over several months, she was clearly getting desperate for success. The email had been short, just a few words asking for our help, and a phone number. The brief and cold call didn't reveal much more, but Sam said he had told her that the crying lady wouldn't leave him alone. I didn't really want us to go, not without knowing how he had found out what her email was at least. Part of me suspected Sam was giving it out now without telling me. She had insisted though, the house was only half a day's drive north. Jake and Alan were predisposed, so we went alone, just the two of us and a few cameras. Oh, and my gun, as always. We'd do a hotel and be back by the next day. The early winter air was starting to get crisp even during the day, making me wonder if I should buy a van or SUV or something. The open-topped Jeep was great for summertime but maybe hadn't been the best choice for my first and only vehicle in retrospect. The dry desert and grassland eventually gave way to hills and forests as we passed through Tonto. A few hours later, with the help of Google Maps, we arrived at the little house on the edge of the woods. It looked like one of those old turn-of-the-century style country homes, two stories with a little porch out front. We both approached the door together. I had my gun concealed but ready, not that I'd likely need it. But better safe than sorry when dealing with some of these weirdos. A few knocks, and no reply. Sam tried calling. It took a few rings but he picked up. They exchanged a few words, I could only hear her side of the conversation, and then she hung up. He doesn't live here, he said he'll be here in 30 minutes. We waited on the porch and took in the area. It was actually a really nice place, a remote little clearing surrounded by forest. The kind of place I'd imagine retiring to someday with Sam. Sam was halfway through a cigarette when the truck appeared, heading our way. The man who emerged had a long white beard. He looked like some kind of hillbilly wizard in his flannel shirt and jeans. Name's Jenkins, thank you for coming so quickly. He extended his hand to Sam and then me. You must be Samantha then? I knew pretty much nothing about the guy or why we were there, and Sam hadn't been able to say much either. He had just begged her to come without offering much of an explanation. It was part of the reason I was worried. Instead of inviting us inside though, he had us follow him to a little picnic table around at the back of the house near the woods. I was hoping for some kind of reason to be said as to why we were there, 
And that was exactly what I got once we were all seated. I'm sorry I haven't told you much, she listens to my phone calls. I was quite sure the only thing we were going to discover that day was mental illness. You all coming all this way means a lot to me. So you said something about this lady, what's going on? Sam asked. Well, she's in the house. That's why we're talking back here. I'll take you inside in a bit, but first I wanted to just ask y'all a few questions, if I may? Sam nodded, and I had no reason to object. You two been doing this a while? Seen some weird shit? Just since earlier this year. Sam replied. Well pull up your pants cause I got some weird shit for you. I gotta get rid of her. Do you think you can help me? I could tell he was hopeful, but he still hadn't told us anything yet. So I jumped in. We need to know what exactly this is all about first. Jenkins acknowledged the point and started to explain. Like I said she's in the house. On the wall. I've tried to get rid of her but she always returns. She calls me sometimes, just crying and sobbing. Mostly it seems like just an annoyance, but God help you if you overstay your welcome in the house. I still didn't really understand where this was all going, but he went on. I need to sell the place, I need the money real bad, but I can't while she's still there. She's very particular about her company. He eyed us somewhat suspiciously. You two come alone? Anyone else coming I should know about? There wasn't, so we said as much. Anyone know you're here? A weird question, one I didn't really care for. I lied and said yes. It was a half-truth, Jake and Alan didn't know exactly where we were, just that we were on expedition. Probably for the best, Jenkins concluded. Can you introduce us? Sam asked. Of a sorts. But before I do, you need to know something. If she doesn't like you, we gotta go. He didn't elaborate on what that meant, instead following up with a question. Mind if I bum one of those cigarettes I saw you smoking? Sam pulled out the pack and offered it, plus her lighter. We chatted a few more minutes while he indulged. So she'll always be crying, but you'll know she's particularly unhappy when she starts crying blood. Then it's time to scram. Got it? I didn't really at the time, but he put out the stub of his cig after sucking it in like a vacuum and then led us to the back door of the old house, fumbling with a key and unlocking it. The door creaked as it opened and we entered the mothball of a dwelling. It appeared to be an old kitchen, somewhat modernized from when the place was originally erected I guessed, but still looking like something out of the 50s. Does this place even have power? I asked. It's been shut off for a while. Nobody can live here, and I can't afford utilities for an empty house. Sam poked at some random and ancient looking appliances. She's in the living room usually. I was especially confused, because he kept saying nobody lived there, and yet we were going to meet some old lady who presumably lived there? I definitely thought he was crazy. We followed him anyways. Yep, in her usual spot. Jenkins was standing right in front of an old black and white photograph of an elderly lady. Looked like it might have been from the 1800s, bordered by a large circular wooden frame. It hung on the rather plain wall. Sam sneezed. My allergies weren't doing great either, this place had not been cleaned and the dusty air was aggravating. We both approached the old picture. There was water accumulated along the bottom of the frame. In fact, I could now see the wood was deeply stained by it. This is her? I asked. There was no way this ancient woman could still be alive. Where is she? Upstairs? Sam touched the wet surface of the photograph and tasted it, much to my disgust. It's salty. Jenkins explained. She's long dead, my great-great. Nah, she lives in the photo now. Shit. I recall how much I hated the haunting and ghostly expeditions back then, like it were yesterday. Those swaying shadows we had seen at the mine still creeped me the fuck out. Hopefully this one would turn out to be nothing. You said she calls you? Sam queried the stranger. Pretty much every day, sometimes every other. Never says a word, just weeps into the phone. Have to hang up on her. I guess I feel bad doing it. He looked like he didn't give a shit though. Uncertain what was expected of us, I asked the question which had been on my mind almost since he introduced us. What do you want us to do? Why are we here? Sam rubbed her fingers across the woman's eyes, revealing the strange sweat emanating slowly from them. I don't know, I just. I don't know what to do. I gotta get her out of here so I can sell the house. I guess I'm desperate. He replied. Sam of course enthusiastically accepted, even though I was sure she had no idea what she was accepting exactly. We'll try. Can we stay here tonight? She answered. Typical. I would highly recommend you camp outside, if you want to stay. I should have mentioned that. I got some sleeping bags and a tent in the truck though, figured you all might want to spend the night and I forgot to tell you to bring tents and whatnot. 
I didn't really mind, a hotel would have been nice but we'd camp plenty of times. Mind if I stay with you all? No way I'm sleeping in the house but I'll share a camp with you too if you'll have me. I've got food and other shit in the truck. We agreed. I would have preferred he didn't, but he didn't seem dangerous. Just old and maybe a bit confused. Camp went up behind the house, between it and the woods. He had brought two tents, apparently having anticipated all of this. Much to Sam's delight, not only was he a smoker but a whiskey drinker as well. The two seemed inseparable as they demolished a bottle of Jack Daniels together. We both listened to his wild stories about the house and the old lady. I grew up in the house, just me and my ma. Great great wasn't so bad back then. I think she liked ma, but she never cared much for me. Once mama up and died and it was just me and myself, she drove me out of the place. The old man seemed surprisingly emotionless as he burped out his story. I tried to put her out in the woods a few times. Always wound up back in the house somewhere. Considered burning it but it started crying blood as I carried it to the fire, and I lost my nerve. Honestly, I don't have the slightest clue what to do with her. Sam had a couple questions. How did she drive you out? What does she do exactly? He didn't hesitate to continue his tale, true or otherwise. Oh, she can be mean. I was scared for my life, drove off and never looked back. Only been back to do some basic maintenance work and only during the day. I was about to say something but he had more to say himself. The camera continued to film the whole exposition. Let me tell you something. Don't you go wandering in the woods after dark. She likes to take walks. And don't ever go upstairs, that is her private place. She doesn't like strangers. Just stay out here at night. He sounded serious. Some more idle conversation transpired. So you said you were retired, what do you do now? I asked, just looking for anything to pass the time. Hunting mostly. Can clean and skin a doe like nobody this side of the hills. I had never been hunting before, I only had a gun at all because it used to be my dad's. We sat around the old wooden table a bit longer before he excused himself to go piss and fall asleep. He stood at the edge of the woods, swaying back and forth as he urinated drunkenly. His black silhouette reminded me of the shadows at the mine. Once he had zipped himself up in his tent, I partook in some of the leftover liquor. Sam snuggled up next to me on the picnic table, a little battery-powered lamp being our only source of light in the cool dark evening. As soon as he was snoring loudly, she sprung it on me. I'm horny, let's go have sex in the house. We can check it out while we're in there. Of course. Wow. That's such a profoundly stupid and terrible idea, Sam. Not to mention disrespectful. I couldn't resist biting back with sarcasm. I suppose we should do it upstairs and then go for a walk in the woods when we're done. I could swear the girl mistook all of his warnings as invitations. Probably intentionally, just to annoy me. She had me by the crotch though, figuratively at least, and was giving me those eyes. Don't be a pussy, I already have one of those. Never really having a say in these things, I gave in when she made it clear she was going to go with or without me. As always. We crept in through the back door, and I took extra care to close it slowly and avoid the creak it had made earlier. We had the lamp with us, but it still felt nauseatingly dark. The kitchen was scoured first. Nothing in the fridge, of course, as there was no power. Some old cans were identified in some of the shelves, as well as a full set of dishes and cutlery. Nothing worth noting. The living room was next. It's gone. Sam noticed it first. Where the old black and white photo had been hanging, there was now just an empty nail on which it had presumably dwelled. Where do you think it went? She whispered. I know that back when she asked it, I didn't have any sort of answer. I should have just taken its absence as a big reason to get the hell back to our tent. But Sam's subtle and stubborn charisma kept me going, despite everything my brain was screaming at me. I almost protested when she started going upstairs, but decided there was no point. I had remembered to bring my handheld camera at least, and silently filmed the place with the night vision setting as we ascended together. It was a pretty normal looking hallway up top. A few rooms on either side and what looked to be a bathroom at the end. The rooms were peeked into one by one as we progressed. Once we had been through them all, it became clear there was little besides some old beds and furniture. Sam took the opportunity to corner me in the dark. Apparently she wasn't lying about being horny after all. Sam more or less dragged me to one of the bedrooms and we began a brief and questionable intercourse. It was a bit hard for me to get into it in that old house but, hey, I'm a guy. Sometimes a dick has a will of its own. I was just starting to lose myself in her when she stopped, blue balling me. I opened my eyes to see what was going on, and saw her looking at the wall in the dim light of the electric lantern. And there it was, hung on said wall. It was like it was watching us. 
The fuck? Sammy disengaged me and went over to it, leaving me uncomfortably erect on the bed. It looked like the photo was staring right at me, just as a consequence of the angle, but it made me incredibly embarrassed regardless. Don't touch it. I nearly shouted, but of course she did. It's crying blood. Like he said. She had it on her fingers. I could see the red streaks going down from the old lady's eyes, just as well as Sam could even as she spoke it. Sam, I told you this was a stupid idea. Let's get back to the tent. I was already getting my pants back on, any sensuality in the moment long since lost. She didn't seem afraid though. I wonder why she's crying? She questioned. I wasn't sure it mattered why. Maybe because we invaded her privacy and had sex in the one place Jenkins specifically told us not to go. Just maybe? I'm still not sure how I managed to let her drag me into these kinds of blatantly ridiculous situations so frequently back then. Once we were downstairs again, Sam wanted to do another search of the floor. We hadn't really explored it beyond the kitchen and the living room. I tried to suggest it could wait until morning, but she just went about her merry way, discovering a small room with a couple old chairs and an antique looking television. Not much else to be found in there, her next discovery was a downstairs bathroom. The drug cabinet had some 40 years expired aspirin and Valium in it, and a few bandages, but otherwise the place was empty as well. There wasn't even a shower curtain. The last door she tried was locked. It was directly behind the stairs. It's either a closet or stairs down to a basement. Nothing else it could be. I was quite certain as I said it. I could also nearly read her thoughts. No, we're not breaking it open. I stopped her before she could suggest it. Much to my relief, I eventually got her to head back to the tent with me. The old man was still snoring in his own, oblivious to our little excursion. I fell asleep pretty quickly, despite the subpar quality of the padding he had given us to lay on. It felt like only seconds had passed when he woke us, though I could tell from the light that it was morning. I remember the anger in his voice being the first thing I noticed. I told you all not to fucking go upstairs. I may be old, but you think I'm a fool? We both scrambled into our clothes and out of the tent as fast as we could. Old man Jenkins was standing right outside, arms crossed and a furious look on him. He waited for us to fully assemble in front of him, our hair still a mess from a night of tossing and turning. It was a mistake to ask you two to come, I knew you couldn't be trusted. He was now just rambling at himself as much as us. I gave Sam an angry look, and she took a figurative step back. I could see it in her eyes, she was feeling regret. She tried to make amends. We were just taking a look, that's why we're here isn't it? He cackled. Oh yeah? Fucking like little rabbits on her bed more like. Definitely looking for something, I'd say. Even as he laughed, he was clearly upset. He had begun pacing, and I was more than ready for him to just tell us off so we could get the hell out of there. But I had to ask. How did you know? You were asleep. He stopped and looked me dead in the eye. See, I knew you didn't believe me when I said she was real. She told me everything. She? Told you? I wasn't sure I understood. Sam finally had to say something. Look, we were curious, I'm sorry. We won't do it again. She hesitated, but then completed her thought. Do you want us to help you with this or not? She wore her guilt on her sleeve even as she tried to sound confident. Jenkins didn't respond immediately, but I had other questions on my mind. He could talk with her? And he was still trying to get rid of her? How do you two speak? He glared at me for a few seconds. I already told you, she calls me. I thought you said she just cries though? Usually. Sometimes she'll say a few words. Especially if she's distressed. You all managed to do a bang up job of pissing her off. After a tad more back and forth, Jenkins calmed down a bit. I munched on granola with Sam while Jenkins apparently started his day by killing the rest of the Jack Daniels. So is she actually dangerous? Sam asked. I mean sure it's a bit creepy, crying blood and all that, but like, what does she do? I could see from the man's face he was probably still fighting between his desire to talk about it and his desire to tell us to scram. Apparently the first set of emotions won, and he took a seat across from us, still bearing a stern expression. It ain't her you gotta worry about. It's what's in the basement. Once you are down there, you're in for it. He took the last swig of the whiskey. You two were lucky last night, could have gotten all of us in trouble. Think about that, you're putting your lives at risk sneaking around. You should have just told us. My response just seemed to piss him off even more. God damn it, I did. I told you not to go in there at night. I thought I was dealing with adults, not a bunch of kiddos who need hand holding and spankings. We eventually sorted things out, but his demeanor was never the same toward us after that. 
He stayed quiet and only spoke when he had something specific to say. He showed us around the house again, but just the downstairs. The photo was back on the wall in the living room. He gave us a nasty look as he wiped the blood off the frame. A bit later he explained in more detail all the things he had tried so far. An exorcist. Throwing out the photo. Donating it to the Salvation Army. Locking it in a safe. The only thing he hadn't tried was destroying it. I remember wondering why. Honestly, I'm scared of her. Not gonna lie. I don't know what would happen if I put the torch to that thing, but I know she has it out for me. She's seen too much. I thought you said she talks to you almost every day? I replied. Oh yeah and doesn't have a nice word to say either. Honestly, she makes my life a living hell. And trust me, I know a thing or two about such things. Weird comment. Sam had a question. So what now? I guess we could try taking it with us? See if we could find anything out about it? He rejected the idea though. She'll just wind up back here again, like she always does. As we sat in the kitchen, I got a call on my phone and put my camera down to answer it. Daniel speaking. It was one of my mom's attorneys. He apparently wanted to discuss the company we were setting up under Sam and my name to fund our expeditions. I told him to call us back later. He asked for Sam's number as well, since she was listed as a partner, so I gave it to him, but the reception was bad. I had to spell it out a few times and then hung up in annoyance. The day dragged on and I wasn't sure what exactly we should do next. Seemed like we had mostly seen what there was to see, and Jenkins simply shot down any suggestions Sam or I had as far as what to do about his problem. It just seemed like a waste of time, as weird as it was. Sam ended up asking if it was okay to go for a walk in the woods during the day, and he seemed fine with it. We made our way together into the woods. As was typical for Arizona, the trees were all short and almost more bush-like than tree-like in many cases. I knew from school though that their size belied their age, most were likely timeless things which had been there for hundreds of years. The hilly countryside was lovely, and we made our way to the top of a small hill. From there, it was easier to see the mountains which flanked the valley the old man's decrepit house dwelt in. We sat in that spot for a while, enjoying the clear day. Winter was nearly on us, and even this far south we could get some snow from time to time, so soaking in that last bit of warmth was a welcome delay of the inevitable. Sam's phone rang. I figured it was probably the lawyer. I hated how much bureaucracy was involved in something that should be so simple, we just wanted to be able to open a joint bank account to keep funds in for the group. I didn't understand why it needed to be so complicated. Hi, this is Sam. I could hear it, even as she had it pressed to her ear. Sobbing. Sammy gave me a wide-eyed look as she put it on speakerphone. Hello? Who is this? She asked, but the woman on the other end was bawling. I'm sure we both knew immediately who it was. That it was the lady from the picture. Who else could it have been? I was pretty good at dealing with strange stuff like this by now, but the despair in her voice was unwelcome. It was almost like she was there with us, face in hands, mourning over the death of a loved one or something equally tragic. But when she spoke, my heart sank. Run, she shouted between cries. Run. And then she hung up. We hurriedly made our way back to the house after that. It took about an hour to get there, spent mostly in silence. I wanted to talk about what had just happened, but was uncertain what to say. I supposed at the time we could just drive away, but I wasn't sure what we were driving away from exactly. The old man Jenkins was lounging on the equally old picnic table out back when we arrived, apparently up to nothing but bird watching. He had seemingly located another bottle of whiskey he hadn't revealed the night before, and was well into it. I could tell he was already quite drunk. We sat around in silence for a bit as I wondered if I should tell him about the call. Sam made the decision for me though. She called us. While we were hiking. Jenkins looked at Sam with a raised eyebrow. Oh yeah? He said it calmly and I didn't pay much attention to the look of anxiety on his face, but I recognize it quite clearly remembering it now. Yes, she said we should run. Why did she say that? I could tell Sam looked concerned. That was unusual for her. But the tone of the woman's voice had been particularly emotional, and I was pretty worked up as well. He was nearly slurring his words when he responded. Ah, she's like that. Always trying to drive me off. Probably still mad that you spoiled her bedroom. The old man had seemed so mad about it earlier, and now he was just brushing it off like it was nothing. It was odd. What I didn't understand is how the old lady got Sam's phone number. Maybe if she is a ghost, or whatever, they have a sort of afterlife phone book? The very idea of it made me nearly laugh. It was absurd. Then I remembered. The call with the lawyer. 
If she could see us having sex on the bed, maybe she could hear me giving the man Sam's number? That had to be it. Still, it was weird. Ghosts calling on phones and all that. I still didn't understand why we were there, since there was no plan whatsoever. We were just wasting the time away with this drunken geezer in the middle of nowhere. I was starting to think it might be time to call it quits when Sam asked another question. What's in the basement? Why is it locked? Two questions, I guess. Jenkins got deadly serious. Now don't go fucking around down there. It's a danger. Yeah you said that, but in what way? What's in the basement? It was quite clear he didn't like the line of questioning. That's where she keeps the bodies. Just don't go down there. You all are here to help me figure out how to get rid of her. The bodies? Are you telling me people have died here? I was incredulous. A few, he stated it like it was nothing at all. Well if our goal is to get rid of her, we sure as hell aren't making any obvious progress toward that goal. Let's just get a fire going and be done with it, I'm quite sure the thing is flammable. I need to get back home and so does Sam. We didn't really need to be anywhere, but I was growing increasingly nervous about everything. Bodies in the basement were not something I had signed up for. Sam seemed to disagree though. I don't know, we don't know what burning it will do. Plus, she didn't seem like she was bad, she seemed like she was warning us about something. Trying to help. You know what, maybe you all are right though. Jenkins took to his feet in a wobble. Somehow, he had downed half the bottle just since they had woken up. I've been too afraid to try but there's no time like the present. Let's burn that bitch. I don't need her calling strangers. He drunkenly started toward the woods, grabbing random branches and foliage. Stacking them in an empty patch of dirt near the edge of the forest. Sam, it might be time to just admit defeat and go. The sight of the inebriated old man trying to create a fire pit so we could burn a ghost lady's portrait was just a bit too much for me. I couldn't get her warning out of my head. Run. Run. The more I thought about it, the more I just wanted to go. We have to see this through. Sam tried to reassure me. But I don't think we should burn it. She added. He seemed hell-bent on it now though, having assembled a huge stack of twigs and branches. It hadn't rained in a while so they were probably a powder keg waiting to ignite. I was pretty sure that even putting the supernatural aside, this was probably a bad idea just from a fire safety management perspective. I decided to chip in and help remove some of the foliage around the pile, creating a small buffer area. At least we wouldn't all burn to death in a wildfire if we actually decided to go through with this. As Jenkins went to go get a can of gasoline from the back of his truck, I made my way over to Sam to talk through my tumultuous thoughts. I think I've changed my mind as well. We shouldn't let him do this. At least not while he's drunk, she agreed, and we intercepted him as he made his way back, red plastic container in one hand, with splitting axe in the other. But not before I gave Sam my pistol, just in case anything weird happened if we did end up burning the photograph. I think you should wait until you're sober. I told him as we approached. He just stared at me blankly. Boy, you know how many times I tried to do this sober? It ain't gonna happen. She scares the ever-living shit out of me. Won't shut up. Seriously, I'll do it for you if that's what it takes, just sober up first. He was hesitant, but after some persuasion he reluctantly agreed and we spent the few remaining hours of daylight letting him sleep off the liquor. Hypocritically, Sam started drinking. I might have done a shot or two myself as we talked. I want to go in the basement. She eventually confessed. Not a goddamn chance. If that lady was dangerous, there was no way I was going to let Sam just wander down there. Sometimes I wondered if I could even trust her to cross the street safely. We decided to check out the photo a bit more while we waited. It was still hanging on that same wall in the living room. Wet tears still pouring from the eyes of the portrait, defying any explanation I could conjure. The two of us just sat on the sofa opposed to it for a while, speculating on its origin and nature. We should call her again. Sam just blurted it out. I hadn't even considered the fact that we technically had the number she had dialed us from on her phone. Would that even work? I didn't have to wonder for long, Sammy had her phone out right away and had clicked the dial button on the last number in her incoming call list. I listened with anticipation as it rang. I wasn't entirely shocked when we got a number not in service message in return. It was an interesting idea though. When we got back outside, I managed to track down a shovel and started digging out the area around the pile of sticks Jenkins had assembled. As dry as it was, this really was a bad idea. We'd have to talk the old man out of it. Why was he so eager all of the sudden? He woke up a couple hours later, right as a brilliant sunset began to dominate the horizon. Jenkins and I worked on the fire pit a bit more while I tried to convince him to reconsider. I even offered to chop it up with the axe instead. 
No way, that old witch is gonna burn. He seemed insistent. We had the fire going as it started to get dark. I was pretty confident at this point that at least we weren't going to accidentally start a forest fire. Jenkins went inside and came out with the photograph, Sam and I both watched with anticipation as he carried it toward the small bonfire. Uh, it's crying blood again, Sam stated as he passed by. Fuck her. His reply was terse and dismissive. The sound of Sam's phone ringing disrupted the quiet crackling of the fire. She answered. Hello? Jenkins paused. We could all hear the sobbing coming through the phone. It was her. Sam put it on speaker so we could all hear, but she just cried and cried for several minutes. Hang up on her. Let's get this over with. Jenkins started to move toward the fire again. But her shouts were startling. Run. He killed my granddaughter. Run. The old man started cursing as he heard the words, and he chucked the old photo right into the fire. The blood-curdling screaming which immediately began to emanate from Sam's phone was as horrifying as it was surprising. It sounded like the woman was being burned alive. Sam and I were both frozen, trying to make sense of everything. In retrospect, I stood there too long. It was only when I saw the look of terror in Sam's eyes that I realized turning my back to the old man had been a grave error. Daniel. Sam's cry was the last thing I remember before I felt my skull split open. I don't remember much after that, everything went black. At least until the gunshot woke me. I had never been in so much pain before. It was like the worst migraine imaginable. But I was apparently alive. Feeling the back of my head, I instantly regretted doing so. The spot where the axe had struck was obvious, even if it wasn't very deep. It must have been quite dull, or I quite lucky. Another gunshot. It was coming from inside the house. I staggered my way there. Where was Sam, I wondered. I instinctively went for my gun but it wasn't there. It was hard to remember anything through the excruciating pain throbbing through my brain but I did recall I had given it to her. My fears consumed me as I entered the old house. It took a moment to orient myself in the dark spaces within. Once my eyes had adjusted though, I saw it. The basement door was open. I went back out and grabbed the shovel, then began the dark descension down into the abyss. There was a light at the bottom of the stairs it seemed. I could hear crying. It was Sam. Thank God. I ran down as fast as I could and found her weeping her eyes out, huddled in the corner. And I wasn't entirely surprised to see Jenkins body laying across the room, a small pool of blood seeping from his head where he had been shot. Sammy, are you okay? I ran over and tried to comfort her, discarding the shovel as I did. My own agony seemed immaterial in that moment. I had to kill him. I had never seen her cry like this before. I didn't have a choice. I had to. It's okay. It's going to be okay. I tried to be reassuring, but I knew I probably needed to go to a hospital soon as my vision spun and my head throbbed. I'd only later find out that I had experienced a mild concussion. He said he was going to kill me slowly. Her sobs continued. I thought you were dead, Daniel. We held each other close for a while before she started to calm down. You're hurt. We need to call an ambulance. Sam immediately pulled out her phone and dialed 911. While the police and paramedics made their way to the remote house, I sat and nursed my aching skull while Sam explored the basement. I hadn't even noticed anything about the room when I had first entered it, I had been so focused on her and the body of the old man. It was only when I started to look around that the true horror of the place dawned on me. The cage in the corner. The wrist restraints hanging from the ceiling. The camera in another corner. And the icebox in yet another. What the fuck had he been doing down here? I was sure I didn't want to know. But curiosity got the best of me. When I opened the freezer, I stood in silence for a while as I stared at the dismembered, skinless body parts stacked inside. It was impossible to tell how many people were in there. I would later find out it was at least four. It was Sam though who located the tapes. Old mini VHS style ones. Each one had a name written on it in Sharpie. Sam picked one at random and took it to the camera. It had a little pop-out display. Sammy, don't. I couldn't stop her, but I had no desire to see whatever was on it. But I could hear it. The screaming reminded me immediately of the noises the old lady made when Jenkins had thrown her portrait in the fire. I could see Sam put her hands over her mouth and she started crying again. The screams got even more intense and she suddenly looked like she was about to vomit. I ran over to her as she retched in the corner. Turn it off. She shrieked. I almost took a glance at the screen before thinking better of it. I ended the horrible noise instead. Going over and kneeling next to her, and we were both quiet for some time. Aside from her sobs. Eventually, she produced some trembling words. 
How could anyone be so cruel? I didn't have an answer. I hadn't seen what she had. And I never asked her about it. I didn't want to know what was on that tape. The sticker said her name was Elizabeth Davis, she cried the words. I'm not sure why she felt compelled to say it. Maybe it served as some kind of little memorial in Sam's mind. The police eventually arrived, and I was whisked off to the nearest emergency room, Sam to the police station to answer questions. Apparently, I was lucky as hell to have survived. No serious brain damage, as far as they could tell, but I still get nasty headaches to this day. We didn't do expeditions at all for a while after that, mostly just hiding away in my apartment together. Eventually though, after most of the winter had passed, we began to talk about what had happened again. Even if just a little. If you hadn't given me your gun, I would have been on one of those tapes. It was a sobering and frightening thought. I was no gun enthusiast but I promised myself we'd go get her a pistol and a concealed carry permit as soon as we could. After all that, phantoms, monsters, and other oddities seemed almost tame. I could deal with shadows and ghosts. None of it was nearly as frightening as what I had seen in that hopeless basement. And to think we had spent the night in a tent right next to the man. I had come to realize that the scariest thing in the world was other people. Or so I had thought at the time, at least. Experience is a strange mistress, and in those moments I was certain I'd never encounter anything as disturbing or terrible than the truth about that psychopath and what he had been doing. But that's just the way these things go, you never really know something until you know it. After our long break, we started doing expeditions again. Some of which would eventually come to make this incident look like child's play. But I wouldn't know that until later. Time brings clarity. Even time didn't answer all my questions though. I understand now why he wanted to be rid of the old lady, but why had the old man invited us out to do something he could have done himself? Maybe he was just looking for more victims. I'll never know. But I did know one thing at the time, I remember quite clearly. I knew why the old lady had been crying. She had seen a lot. 